I don't know, is that better? I, I mean, for you than the internet? Yeah, if you can't hear in the back, come on, probably got plenty of them. <laughs> All right, we're ready. Okay, we're ready, we're recording. Yes. Okay, perfect. Again, introduction of our second speaker here will be about the same time slots and be have a five minute question section at the end. Marty, who I am so pleased to meet today, has always been about the we in water and how human decisions impact water quality. He has over 25 years of experience working in the public and private sectors, looking holistically at the interaction between human activities and water quality. In his current role with the district, Marty focuses on solving problems adaptively to move at the speed of trust and believes that working in communities, focusing on pollution prevention is just the way we must do business. So with that, I will give you as much time as possible. Please jump right in and uh, elaborate on anything I may have missed and we will look forward to hearing about this. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much and thanks everyone and, and welcome. Um, so uh, the Madison Municipal Sewer District, we're a municipal corporation, so we're located in Madison, but we actually cover a large area. And so we really were created for the purpose of treating wastewater. Um, and we were established in 1930, so been around for over 90 years. And we serve 26 different communities. City of Madison is our largest customer. Uh, and it covers about 184 square miles and about 360,000 people that we serve. So all that equates to a lot of hidden infrastructure. We have about 141 miles of pipe. You can see in that map uh, underground with 18 pumping stations. So typically in a wastewater treatment system uh, district of this size, we need pumping systems to push the wastewater up and over hills and things like that. Um, and so all that accumulates in about 40 million gallons of wastewater coming to our treatment plant every day. And if you think of Camp Randall Stadium, uh, that's about filling that whole thing up about 50, 60% full and like flushing it every day type of thing. So that's how much, how much water we get. Um, and our governance is, uh, since we're a municipal corporation not associated with any of the customer communities we serve, we have our own commission that governs the district activities and the commissioners are appointed by our customer communities. Uh, so that's, that's our governance. So as part of the wastewater treatment system, uh, oh, not working, there we go. We can go one more. Sorry, I said look up at the picture, I didn't even look behind me and I, you didn't see the, the nice picture of the pipes over there, okay, is that? Good, that's working. Okay, awesome. So as part of the wastewater treatment uh, process, we generate biosolids, which is a byproduct. And uh, somehow doing something with those solids is unavoidable. We have to figure out something to do or else the plant wouldn't be able to operate. So over our history, our 90 plus years, we've always looked for ways to improve the management and reuse of those biosolids and, and do it in a way that is efficient and environmentally beneficial. So way back in the 1930s when the, when the district was first formed, uh, they took all the solids and, and put them all out on these sand drying beds and actually bagged them and sold it as fertilizer. So back then the name was nitro hummus. So if you ever want to do a fun Google search, you can type in nitro hummus and see what that was all about. It was really labor intensive. And so basically when the depression hit the 40s, we couldn't find anyone to help do that type of work. So what we transitioned to was more of what you think uh, wastewater treatment plants traditionally do, which is store their biosolids in these big lagoon systems. And so that's what we did starting in the 40s. Um, and then uh, into the 60s and 70s, we switched and started taking those biosolids and, and creating a land application program. So in the 70s, we, we started going strictly to agricultural lands and we coined uh, the term for our product MetroGrow, and we still use that term today. So if you hear people refer to MetroGrow, that's a biosolid product that comes from the district. Um, and, and so we still use the lagoons for storage, but we had a land application program that was pretty robust. Um, but uh, after a while, the, the storage wasn't enough. As you know, the more growth in communities, the more biocells we're gonna get. It never stops, never ends, and actually increases. And so then we uh, built some storage tanks to help Help, will help manage the biosolids. And so those were built in the 90s. Um, and so we've had them ever since. And so we have a land application program today. We store our biosolids in tanks when we're not able to land apply. And, and that's how we operate. The one thing I do wanna uh, call attention to is that 
The fact that we have a land application program, there are many other ways you can manage biosolids. You can incinerate, you can bring it to the landfill. But our commission, uh, ever since the, the, uh, we were established, and even now you can see up here, you can't read them, but has established owner expectations. So our owner communities expect the district to act in a certain way, provide a certain level of service. And some of those owner expectations really are looking for us to take a holistic approach um, and really want us to look at this whole nutrient cycle. So we think of all of us uh, contribute, we eat food, uh, we go to the bathroom. And so we get the byproduct comes to the wastewater treatment plant. And so we can do a beneficial reuse by then taking that back onto the land that's fertilizer to help then create more food for us to eat and sort of like this, this uh, nutrient people, water, wastewater cycle. And so, so that's really what we're aiming for, this holistic look. And the one thing I'll mention, and I'll, I'll mention in a couple, couple slides later, is that this holistic look really fits into the district's adaptive management project. So as one of our phosphorus regulatory requirements, we have an adaptive management project called Yahara Winds to help manage the nutrients from the landscape. And so that idea of uh, getting nutrients at the source before they hit into our waterways is also the idea of keeping nutrients in this closed loop system uh, to benefit everyone. All right. So a little bit of st stats about our biocells. I gave you some stats about the wastewater treatment. So uh, those 40 million gallons of water we get every day when we do the wastewater treatment process, that um, turns into about 110,000 gallons of biocells every day. So that's about 38 million gallons that we put out in farm fields every year. We have five staff to help with that. Um, we have a system where we have a trailer system, a trucking system, and an applicator system. So this picture up on the screen is one of our large applicators that goes out in the field and underground injects the biosolid. So that's how it's applied. So it's the implement on the back, you can see, basically opens up a little bit of the land. Uh, there's hoses that inject the biosolids underneath the surface. And, and that, that's how we apply. Um, so we have hauling seasons. We can't apply all year round. Uh, Biosolids hauling is strictly regulated uh, for good reason. And so just like any type of other fertilizer application, you're really not allowed to do it on frozen ground. And in Wisconsin, that means that there's definitely months of the year we can't apply. So that's why we have those storage tanks and our hauling seasons typically are in the spring. Uh, a little bit in the summer and mostly in the fall. So we go in the spring before uh, the, the seeds are put into the ground, and then we go into the fall once the crops are harvested. So one of the ways people always ask, well, how do you make sure you have enough land to actually apply these biosolids? Like, do you charge for it or how does this all work? Our program is completely free to the farmer. Uh, we have a free program. All we ask is that they work with us on our schedule for application. And actually we have some incentive programs for that. So in the spring, you can imagine farmers wanna get out there and plant as fast as they can. So if they were doing it all on their own, they control the schedule. When they get Metro growth from the district, they're on our schedule. So it's a little bit of a challenge. And so what we do is we have a, a, a what we call the yield guarantee program that says that if you were gonna start planting on this day, what would your yield be at the end of the full cropping season? And if we cut into that because our schedule doesn't work, at the end of the year, when we figure out what the cost of, of your crops are and the yield you would have missed, we'll make up that difference. So we have a yield guarantee program that helps us keep these acres open for when we need to apply them. Um, so outline the program. I uh, just wanted to outline some of the challenges with the program. So I told you we have a land application program, agricultural program. We could have chose to go a different direction, but this is what we're doing because of that closed loop sustainable cycle I talked about. Uh, some of the challenges is that agricultural land is regulated as well. Um, we're regulated, they're regulated. So farmers who are mindful of phosphorus and excess nutrients have specific cropping systems and styles that they wanna crop with. I showed you that picture up there before. We have large implements on the back and we have to underground inject. That means we have to disturb the soil. But we know that we're promoting farmers to do no-till, to not disturb the, the soil, to keep nutrients where they are. So that's in conflict with actually how we want to land apply, even though our product is beneficial. So, so that's a little bit of a challenge for us to find farmers that are still willing to actually have some type of tillage, um, especially in our area 
in the Madison Lakes, phosphorus is number one on people's minds. And so we have a lot of progressive farmers in our area that really don't do tillage. Um, the other thing is application rates. So our product, we're regulated for nitrogen application rates and farmers want nitrogen obviously for their coin, corn and soybean rotation. They also like phosphorus. Our product is really, really low in phosphorus, really, really high nitrogen. If you were gonna put together a perfect fertilizer, like a commercial fertilizer, the balance really isn't there. So our, our application rates are, are limiting. And so sometimes farmers have to supplement with other fertilizers. And when you supplement with other fertilizers, then we get into a situation of potentially having more nutrients available for runoff, runoff which we don't like to see in that cycle. So that, that's a challenge. The other challenge is uh, urbanization. Um, we're a district located right uh, in Madison. And when you talk about hauling biosolids distances, there's really a, a, a cost effective distance is about 30, 35 miles. And 35 miles is like at the top end. You don't really want to go that far. But we're, gonna ha we're having to go further and further because of urbanization to find these fields to actually apply the biosolids. So increasing urbanization resulting in less land is a challenge. And, and the big challenge is weather. Um, like I said, we, we can't apply in frozen ground, but we also have these big equipment and machineries that go out into the farm fields. And so we know soil compaction is, is something that farmers think about, right? We want good soil health. We want to have the nice crevices in the soil and the aggregates and help infiltration, have good soil health. Well, if you compact it a lot with a lot of machinery, you're not going to have that. So um, we really can't go out there if there's any kind of moisture because that's really going to exasperate that sort of compaction. So uh, if we have a lot of weather, we have big challenges. I want to put up this slide to sort of show what weather impacts can have. This is showing the last uh, four years of application, number of gallons. Focus it on the purple bar, which is the far right bar. And you can see that that equated to 2019, uh, which we had a really, really early snow that year. It snowed actually, I remember, right around Halloween and didn't go away, which basically meant the month of November, no hauling at all, couldn't get out there. So we, if you look at the other bars in a normal, more normal years, you can see what we expect to get out in those months. We weren't even close. So we had a situation where we didn't get out what we needed to, we don't have enough storage, and so we had to look for alternate ways to manage a biosolids. We don't wanna do that. We wanna keep that closed loop, closed loop cycle. We don't want to incinerate, we don't want to landfill. So weather is a challenge. So we have, these, we have this awesome program, beneficial, a lot of challenges. How can we make sure our program is sustainable moving now into the next 90 years? So we wanted to look at what we're actually doing and do an assessment. So we did a, a biosolids management plan to sort of look at that. And what we wanted to really look at is uh, look at our current program, what are our challenges and baseline and sort of like outline some of that. We want to look at um, how we should evaluate our program. Should we look at economics? Should we look at the environment? Should we look at all those things together? What's most important for us as a district for a land application program? And then we evaluate uh, all the alternatives. And by alternatives, we mean an alternative to the current metrical product. So I mentioned we have a metric or product that's underground injected through those hoses, which means it's a fairly liquidy, watery product. It's about 5% solid. So you can think of it as jello, more like pudding, okay? So it'd be kind of in between that, right? Uh, so that, that's sort of the consistency. Uh, and so there are other products that are completely different. You might've heard of uh, the product coming out of Milwaukee Met, uh, which is a duplicate name. Someone tell me. No. Yes. Melorganite. Thank you. I knew that was going to be helpful. Melorganite. You want to hear Melorganite? They sell it at Menards, sell it everywhere, right? That's a biosolids product. It's just a dried pelletized product, right? Uh, there's also a lot of other products. Uh, we have an organic composter in medicine called Purple Cow. They compost uh, organically, but they use literally manure. To, to help with the composting process. Well, we have manure, just come from humans, we call it something different, poof, right? So there's also composting products that we can create. So there's all these products that might actually help with some of the challenges we just don't know yet. So that was what the purpose of this whole evaluation. Um, the one thing I wanna just mention about the evaluation is that we're a customer focused program. And so it doesn't matter what product we think actually works best for the district. If the farmers won't take it, it doesn't help us. 
So we have to also find that balance between what's a good product for us with our challenges, but also a product that the farmers will actually take and like. Um, Melorganite, if you, if you know that product I mentioned, that's not for farmers. Uh, farmers don't use Melorganite. So that was for a different customer base. So we have to look at our customer base and make sure the product we choose is actually gonna work with them. This is just a slide showing uh, in, a, in a, this, a succinct form all the different challenges that we have. But we also want to look at the lens of customer focus, but also what are the drivers for our product? Uh, we have a regulatory driver, which is, as I said, Metro, Metro is heavily regulated, the district is regulated, but we also have the end use driver, right? Our products. And so all these challenges you see on the left uh, have different drivers. And so we really wanted to make sure we understood how those all interacted before we found our, our final uh, solution. Okay. All right, so here are the six types of biosolids that through our evaluation that were out there. Um, we have our class B liquid, and I'll, I'll quickly uh, inter introduce some terms here. Class B and class A are the two different classes of biosolids, and they're regulated differently. The difference between the two classes is how much uh, bacteria is actually in the product. So we're regulated for heavy metals, bacteria, everything. And so depending on the bacterial threshold, you can have a class A product. Malorganite is the class A product, which basically means you can put it anywhere you want, no restrictions. You don't have to underground inject it like you do Metrogrow. Metrogrow is a class B, so there's some more restrictions. So that's why we have to underground inject it. So we wanted to look at these different classes of products. So we have a class B product, class A product, and then we have other products that, that are within there, like a thermally dry product like Melorganite, or a liquid product like Metrogirl, but it's actually class A, so you can put it more places. We talked about compost. So these are the six things that we looked at for our products. Um, and what we did is we looked at a, a triple bottom line analysis. You won't be able to read these, but we came up with product scorecards that we're looking at the customer, which I said, the end user, uh, economics, the environment, and then how it fits in with our operations. So if you recall, we are a wastewater treatment plant in the, in the center of Madison. So we don't have a lot of room on a lot of land. And if we pick a product that involves having to have like five acres of space, that might not work for us, right? So that was a consideration of how it fits into our operations. We're able to get these scorecards with all the different scores uh, and the costs to help us sort of figure out what pathway should we start pushing toward uh, that might help us be more, more resilient. Uh, so this is an example of just seeing all the products side by side, not on the scorecard, but just uh, the weighted score for the triple bottom line or quadruple bottom line. And you can see very quickly, the ones with the highest bar is the class A product, um, and then also a dried or compost product. So, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? A uh, product that's dried, a product that uh, it's class A, means you can put it more places, but if it's dried, you can apply it more ways. You don't need to have specialized equipment. You can use other equipments, right? You can actually maybe store it and stack it for when you actually need it. So if the weather is bad, you just don't go out, right? So you have some op opportunities there. Uh, we also were able to say, okay, without looking at the overall score, what if our commission or the district said, you know what? We don't care about how much it costs. Uh, we generate our dollars through rate payers, we can operationalize and spread out the cost over 20, 30 years, so our rates won't go up. And so cost may not be a factor, but the environment is number one. We can kind of do different weightings. You can see by the icons, these are different uh, breakouts of the bar graphs of the triple bottom line analysis based on weighting uh, a particular factor heavier. So the environmental focus, class A still comes up on top. But if you kind of look at the economic focus, which is up on the left, those middle bars that were usually the, the, the highest are not the highest anymore. So again, we have to figure out what is gonna be our driver and what is gonna be our particular focus to figure out which product we're gonna to lean toward. Because you can see, depending on which focus you weight, different products may come out differently. All right, so all of that told us that we need to do a better, better job with our data management for efficiencies, which is, which is obvious with any type of large program. Um, but we, we need to do an, an engineering and operational feasibility. So we need to take those top products based on our scores and say, okay, here's our top three. Now, could we actually build it here? Is that possible? 
One of the options is compost, right? You need a lot of room if you're gonna to try to make a compost product. So we'll have to see how that works. So that's a step we're on now, trying to take these top products and say, can we physically actually do it? And what's the cost? If it's gonna cost a billion dollars, then maybe we have to look at something else. And the other piece of this is once we figure out we actually can do it, then we have to take these products out to market. Again, our end user focus, right? Will our customers use it? We need to trial in the field. We need to get people on board to say, is your current equipment work with this? You have to specialize equipment. And then figure out how the distribution might work. We currently at the district do all the distribution for our biocells. We own all the equipment. We hire contractors, we have truck drivers, we go out to all the fields and do the work. But with a different type of product, maybe that model changes. Maybe it's a model where farmers come pick up stuff because they can stack it and store it and it's not, there's not a time window of constraint. So that sort of market research to figure out what's the best way for us to distribute and the best product that's gonna work for the farmers. So I can go back to this slide that you saw before and flip around all the challenges I talked about. And now we have more hope, we have more opportunities, right? So nutrients, I talked about how we have a lot of problems with runoff, compaction, uh, our, our product isn't very good, good uh, balanced. But if we go to a different product, we can address that. We can come up with a product that doesn't run off as much, right? A solid pelletized product may not run off as much as a liquid product and things like that. Uh, soil, soil health has evolved. We talked about compaction. If we cannot have to have uh, a machine that holds, you know, 50,000 gallons of liquid, but instead we had a lighter machine that pulled, pulled behind like a, a spreader, uh, that would be better for the soil. Um, the land use, we talked about shrinking opportunities, but we can flip that around and say, okay, now that we have a different product, maybe we can go further to distribute it. Maybe the distribution is model different where we don't have to worry about shrinking land, we can go find the land. Um, and then climate change, again, the weather. I, I illustrated how important the weather was. Well, if we have a product that is non-dependent on weather, which means you can stack it, store it, put it on when it's convenient, then we don't have to worry about those November months when we have to uh, deal with alternate storage. All right. So the last part here, I'll just give a couple examples of what we've been doing to sort of like further our sustainability efforts. So uh, the first thing we've been doing is uh, looking at if we come up with an alternate product like a compost and things like that, I, I talked about how biosolids, our current product, isn't have the correct balance. Like it's not perfect, right? Now we're talking about all these alternate products. Well, we need to find out if that balance is okay. So we're doing some soil research to figure out what's the nutrient availability of all these different products. Our product in particular, but also a compost product. And you can see this other mix of different products. Um, this nutrient availability really helps farmers understand how the nutrients relate with their cropping systems. And so that's something that uh, farmers expect and want from any fertilizer commercial product. So that's something we need to step up and provide to them. Um, the other product uh, project I wanna talk about was that tillage I talked about. One of the challenges was we have this big tillage, rips up a lot of ground, farmers don't like it because they wanna be sustainable. Uh, we've actually transitioned to completely new tillage. The one you saw in the picture is not what we're using actually anymore. We're using a low disturbance tillage, similar to like low disturbance manure injection that farmers use. We actually now have low disturbance toolbars for our biosound. So there's still a little bit of tillage, but it's really reduced. You can really barely see it. And so now some farmers who have reduced tillage, not no-till, are more apt to uh, utilize our products. Oh, there it is. The last picture. So that's what happens when you can't get out in the fields. You have a lot of water. Uh, trucks get stuck. This particular picture is what we call our, our nurse tank truck. So the way the operations actually work is that we have loading stations at the plant with big semi trucks like you see on the, on the highway. They get full up, they go to the farm field sites. Uh, they put the, the, the material into this tank that just sort of sits at the field that the white part will disconnect. And then the, the uh, applicators I showed a picture before, they can go fill up from that tank and continue doing the field. We're trying to transitioning away, like I talked about extra equipment from this type of model. We now have purchased larger applicators. So instead of having something parked on the side of the road that the applicators fill up with, they're actually can hold it all themselves. And now the trucks that come from the plant can directly uh, transfer the material. So working on that less material, uh, less equipment on the fields bit. Um, so with that, I'll 
stop for any questions. Thanks. Hey, we have a question from the chat uh, online. Um, what does going to the farmers about your product and possibly lowering tillage look like or involve? Can you read that again? What does going to the farmers about your product and, and about uh, talking to them about lowering tillage look like or involve? Like what's the process of going to the farmers? So we have five staff in our Metrogo program, and we have a dedicated person who works directly with our farmers, our regulatory specialist, to make sure that we're hitting all the rules and doing everything correctly. So we have a one-to-one -one relationship with all the farmers we work with. So we have frequent communications that can give them information. And it's actually a great partnership because I talk about, we have these opportunities to figure out new products and end use trials and things like that. Well, we have a ready-made partner group that just wants to help us because they get a benefit. I mean, free fertilizer, I mean, who doesn't want that, right? We actually put it out there for them. And if we put it out there too late, we give them money. So we, we have this great relationship. Um, so that, that's how we communicate with them. Uh, I think I answered the question, yeah. I hope I asked this correct, the, uh, the question correctly. All right, so in the very beginning, the water that you're using, and then of course the, the mass that you're also using, how, like, how do you process that water to begin with? Uh, because that, that certainly obviously has uh, ramifications about what you're putting yeah. into that soil. Yeah, good question. So how do we make the biosolids? So basically we received those 40 million gallons of wastewater and, it, and we have a biological treatment process. So we uh, basically use bacteria and simulate sort of stream activity for the bacteria to eat up all the contaminants and nutrients and things like that. We also have a, a side stream uh, of mineral called Ostara, where we also leach out excess nutrients and create a different product. So through the waste process, by the time it gets to the solids handling side, you know, it's pr pretty clean. But when it, all the solids that get collected as a byproduct of those bugs cleaning the wastewater, then goes into digesters. Like think about like humongous Instapots, right? And just like really heats up the temperature really, really hot, just break down all the bacteria. We do that multiple times. Then we dewater, put it through a process to get all the liquid out, to get it as you know, solid as possible. And then that, that's how we get our product. So you're absolutely correct. The constituents of our product is driven by the community, what they give us, right? And so if we wanna get that nutrient balance, uh, we may have to do things differently or do, do things differently upstream, you know. Does that, that answer your question? Thank you. Oh, good. So farmers are uh, getting more aware of how the microbial communities and um, in the, their soils impacts kind of local farming practices. Do you think like class A versus class B and kind of that microbial natural cycling that's taking place in the egg soils, how does this influence or do you think there's a impact? Have those conversations been building? No, we really haven't had that many conversations because the farmers look at it as just fertilizer. And so they haven't said, okay, if I have a different type of fertilizer, does this change my actual soil health? So Gretchen, as a UW employee, that would be a great research product to understand how different biosolids products impact different microbial properties of soil health. Just like maybe it'd be great to compare it to like a commercial fertilizer brands and things like that. So I turn it back around to you, but we don't really know, but that's a great question. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more quick question and then we will be excused into the Northwoods Expo again. I have a question. How much um, coordination, sharing of information and technology among wastewater resource uh, groups, either regionally or nationally, is done to share technology ideas? So there's definitely national organizations that we're a part of. There's a, a Midwest Biosolids Association, and there's also a Northeast Biosolids Association. Those are the two larger ones that we sort of share ideas. Uh, within the state, you know, we own the largest land application program in the state. And so uh, we have some unique challenges, not many others share, but through uh, New Water up in Green Bay, in uh, Milwaukee, both have some land application, not, not a ton. 
uh, we do coordinate, but we're really uh, sort of the leaders when it comes to this type of thing, because you can imagine that large municipal wastewater treatment plants like of our size, you generate so many biosolids, land application just logistically may never work for you. So we're kind of unique in Wisconsin that we have the landscape we do. Um, so we're, we're sort of tip of spear. So the stuff I showed up there, we're the ones actually going out and sharing it with, with the other utilities sort of, sort of get that knowledge transfer. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks. All right, lunchtime, everybody. <laughs>